We're going to talk to one of the applicants right now. Uh, Andrew Rader is an aerospace engineer. Hi, Andrew. Good to have you on. Thanks for doing this. Hi. Good to speak with you. Yeah, give, give us an idea of, of your background in, in, in just engineering first and, and in science. What do, what do you know? Because you're just not some guy who's sitting on the couch who came across this online. Right. I went to Carleton University for aerospace engineering. I did a bachelor's and master's degree there. And then I went to MIT to do a PhD in long-duration space flights, so how you keep people alive and healthy in space for long periods of time, how you generate artificial gravity going on missions like to Mars, and studying the effects of space on the human body, like radiation and microgravity and things like that. Now, do you agree with the Mars One plan to the point where you applied where we could use maybe existing technology? And I know the trip there would be many months, but we could use existing technology to go there now if we really have the cash and the will to do it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, the technology you need is no more advanced than what we did to get to the moon. It's not really a whole lot harder to get to Mars than it is to get to the moon. I mean, there's some other risks associated with landing, but the technology is about the same. Uh, as long as you send resupply and, uh, and that sort of thing. That's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, getting back is much, much harder, although it's, it's actually false to say we don't know how to get back. It's just much more complicated, and if we make that a prerequisite, then... Uh, I think the mission may not go ahead. And, and here's the thing that I think of is we already know what we need to escape Earth's gravity, right, and, and the propulsion that's required. Um, and, and traveling here, okay, you're right, no problem, even making a landing. But if you want to leave again, you would require, you know, the, the same amount of gear and propulsion that you would almost need to, to launch us off the Earth's surface. Is that correct, or, or would you need less? Yeah, it, it's close to that. I mean, Mars has three-eighths gravity, three-eighths the gravity of the Earth, and it does have a little bit of an atmosphere, about 1%. The amount of fuel you need to get back from Mars is about equivalent to five times the fuel they use to get off the surface of the moon. So that's right. That's why it's hard to get back. There's no rockets on Mars to launch you back to Earth. You can easily get on a giant rocket from Earth to launch to Mars. Now, we stopped going to the moon, I guess, in the early 70s. Is, is this something that maybe we could have even, let's say, went to Mars with what they had to go to the moon in the 70s, let's say, 20 years ago? Oh, yeah, no, 40 years ago. That was the plan, in fact. They were supposed, NASA's plan was to go to Mars in the 1980s. Werner von Braun, the head of NASA, in the 1950s said that the technology to go to Mars essentially exists. I, I mean, there's no, there's no major technological leaps that have to be uh, overcome in order to get to Mars. Now, we don't have the hardware currently. So, I mean, even though there's a difference between technology, like we know how to do it, and we actually have the bits and pieces we would use to get there. We don't have those right now. We were better prepared in, in those terms in 1970 when we had the Saturn V, which is a really heavy lift booster. Now, is it because there, there isn't any one government out there that wants to take this on? And, and maybe that's not true, because I remember George W. Bush said in, in the middle of his presidency that, that he would like to make that a goal. But and yes. I, th I think he offered by uh, somewhere around 2015, didn't he? Uh huh. Well, both Bushes, in fact, had Mars plans. The problem is the timeline is too far. So if you said, say, we're going to go to Mars in 25 years, as U.S. president, that doesn't really mean anything because you're not committing yourself to anything at all. If Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon in 25 years, I'm not even sure we'd be on the moon yet, even though it's been much more than 25 years. Because the problem is, if you don't give yourself a deadline, if you don't give yourself a goal, then you're not really going to do anything to work towards it. And the next president that comes along is just going to cut the funding. Why are we funding this for something in 25 years? There's going to be no return to my presidency. It's because politics works on such a short timeline compared to this that if you don't set a short goal, you're not going to do it at all. It's funny, because a lot of what you said has strong correlations to how we talk about deficit spending and eliminating deficits among government, and you get those great promises, but they usually come at the end of a term, and right. if they're not around, yeah. they don't have to deal with that. Yeah, unless you actually have to deliver something as a politician, as a, an or administrator, you're not going to do anything at all. And that's why you can't say, we're going to go to Mars in 30 years. That means nothing. I mean, we said that more than 30 years ago, right? And we're still not there. So now, you have to... Set a short deadline. Now, that makes it also challenging if you set a short deadline and it increases the funding challenge. Uh, and the only way this could work is if it becomes this massive crowdsourcing project. You know, I mean, if everyone gave a dollar, if everyone donated a dollar, they'd have what they need tomorrow. You know, but if everyone in the world, of course, that's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. <laughs>
Yeah, how did you find out about this particular project, this Mars One uh, effort? Because it, it, it's probably something that, that got a lot of play, maybe where it originated from, but, but to catch the attention of people worldwide, you know, that takes another stroke. I think actually because it's really ambitious and does sound a little bit crazy, it's gotten a lot of attention, right? And, and maybe that's, in some way, maybe that's what you need. I first heard about it on the Colbert Report, which is pretty auspicious, uh, <laughs> about a year ago. And I was pretty quiet about it. I mean, it's, it's something that, when I even heard about it, he was making fun of it. I agreed with it. I thought it was fantastic. But I thought no one else would. You know, I thought I'd be the only one in the room who thought this was a good idea. So I was kind of quiet about it. Uh, and it's, as it's become a little more publicized, I've be- decided to become a little more vocal about it because I really do think that this is a good idea. So, so in an effect, you were almost anticipating this and it was kind of refreshing, even if it was brought up on a show like The Colbert Report as a joke. But you're looking at this thing, this is, these are the kinds of risks that we have to take to, to, to get off this planet. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think that uh, it's it's very worthwhile to send a few people. I mean, you're not everyone looks at this at first and says, "Oh, they're just going, you know, to die on some other planet," right? But it's really just to live and figure out how to live there. And I mean, it's it's much safer to be on Mars than in deep space. So if you don't even have to make the return trip, in terms of a lot of the human factors of the microgravity and the radiation and stuff like that, just going one direction is actually safer from that standpoint. I mean, there's a lot of challenges associated with it. So you know, but I do think it's worth the risk. So so you apply. What 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 did, what kind of information did they need from you? What did they want to know? Yeah, so there's two parts to the application. There's the public profile, which anyone can go on the website and see, which is the video and a little bit of a bio, a short bio. Um, and then they ask you a, a number of questions, and it's, kind of, it's almost like a job application. They ask you your background, your degrees, your um, experiences, and they ask you some questions. How do you deal with stress? How do you deal with different cultures? How do you deal with fear? Um, you know, describe uh, difficult situations you've been in before. So, so you give them all this information, and, and then I'm actually on the site wait right now, and on the front page, when you, when you click on the applicants, it, it, there's a scroll down, and it says, these people applied to go to Mars, and I'm looking at some of the pictures, and it tells you what country they live in, what language they speak, how old they are, and maybe in some cases, a little bit about what they do if you click on them, and it, it almost looks like people can, what, rate them as, as potential candidates? Is that how it works? That's not how it works. People can rate them as potential candidates, but it's not a very lock-hard system because people can go on and just rate themselves a million times. It really doesn't mean that much. That's just for publicity. Uh, The the candidates will not be selected, as far as I know, on that basis whatsoever. I assume that they will select candidates who are interesting and, to some extent, entertaining, uh, because it is a TV show as well. But, uh, I mean, basically, they do want people who are highly competent. Yeah, this would almost play out in a reality TV setting, and this is where some people think it's a little disturbing. And I don't know if do you agree with that aspect of it, or do you think that this would have more merit if they just left that part alone and kept this to be a straight up mission? Right. Well, okay. So my view on that is, ideally, it you know it wouldn't be a reality TV show, and if it is, it has to be the right kind of show that portrays things correctly. You're right. There's a there's a disconnect there between entertainment and competency. I think, and you want everyone to be super competent. And I hope it focuses on that. However, if the reality TV show element brings out the interest, and if it generates enough popularity for this to actually happen, to bring in other sources of funding that wouldn't normally be accessible, then you know maybe that's a good thing. I, I, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you this. Considering what's at stake and the fact that you would go there and, and you don't come back, let's say, not to say that you couldn't ever, but at least in doing this mission, when the, when, when the buzz gets around that you applied for this, what does your family say? What do your friends say to you? They're very supportive, actually. I mean, my mother is not thrilled, but uh, she says that, you know, I have to support you in your dreams. They've known that I've wanted to do this for a very long time. So in some sense, the int- from the interest side, it's not a shock at all. But, you know, they're very supportive. Andrew, thanks again for this. This is most interesting. Yeah, very, very welcome. And not everybody is, is as excited about this, and some people say it's kind of bizarre and it just can't happen in the time frame provided. Uh, Gordon Shepard is a professor of space science with the engineering faculty at York University. He's standing by. We'll get his thoughts when we come back. Forty-nine. We're back. 
look at this Mars One project uh, deal a little bit cri more critically now with uh, Gordon Shepard, who is a professor of space science with engineering at York University in Toronto. Hi, Gordon. Good morning. When you first heard about this and the time frame that was provided, what did you think? Well, I thought it was impossible, and I still think it's impossible. Uh, the man, to, for, to start out, the question really is who is responsible and what responsible what responsibility are they going to take for these young people? I would like to say at first, though, that I want to give credit to the idea, which is a very thought-provoking and creative idea, and credit to the young people that are applying. But uh, there are just so many things that have never been done before that will have to be done, and it's not clear who's really in charge. They essentially have to create a space agency of their own to run the project. When you look at the website, though, they say, well, that's not necessary. There's millions of, there's dozens of commercial suppliers that will provide everything that's needed uh, for the mission, and the technology is uh, already proven, although that's not the case. The launch vehicle hasn't been uh, tested yet. But uh, suppose you look in the, in the future. You, you succeed, you have people on Mars, and the company just goes bankrupt. I mean, who, who is responsible for these people? And that's a very fundamental question. Yeah, that sounds like a record insurance policy to me, and I don't think an insurer would even touch that. Uh, but, but when it comes down to the actual means of getting there, do you feel like if that kind of business, that kind of sign should be left up to you know the governments that we have now and the space agencies that we already have? And even if it takes longer, try to use the resources we have to, to, to come to a, a better way to do it. Yeah, exactly. That's the question. What's the hurry? Why do it now? And the feeling seems to be from the organizers is that we must do it now, but we can't bring people back, so that's just too bad. And uh, whereas uh, government uh, space agencies will wait until they have the technology to really look after people uh, properly. Is, is there even a feeling, maybe, maybe you share this, where, never mind Mars, but just the whole space tourism thing right now as a whole and, and putting people even in orbit, you know, it just seems a little too rushed. Yes, well, the first step is uh, not e is suborbital. Just people will go up and down uh, in a flight of uh, 15 minutes or so. And I think that's fine. That's, that's a way to begin the exploration with uh, humans and uh, human tourism. But to go to Mars and f spend the rest of your life there, that's just uh, too big a step to consider at this time. It's just way premature. In 2023 is when they said they'd want to do this by, but you know that's just a for a lot of people that's just an empty promise. But you never know. But what do you think would be a sufficient timeline? You said what's the rush, but it, let's just say governments had the will to do this now. How long could it take? And 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 should we be planning now? Well, no, no agencies are talking about doing it uh, now, but they still are working on it now, and uh, the numbers you hear are more like 25 years or 30 years. It shouldn't be done until everything is in place to do it and to bring people back. Yeah, and what's the payoff to go, even if it was sometime soon in the next decade or so? What, just to say you've been there? or, or Sometimes I wonder what else is at play, if, if there's thoughts about what great resources could lie under the surface there. Who knows? Yes, there are certainly resources, but uh, that's really long-term. I mean, if you can't bring anything back, <laughs> you're not going to be able to bring anything back, right? So uh, now these things have to unfold on a proper uh, proper time scale, and they have to have the resources at the beginning to know that you're going to be able to do it. Every space program runs into pro pro problems during development, and these take more time and more funding. If you don't have the backing for that, then uh, the project will, will fail. Yeah, and, and look no further than the history of the original Apollo missions and what didn't one explode on the launch pad, and, and of course we all know what happened to Apollo 13. That's right, and the resources available there were enormous. Essentially, they said, uh, you have to, you're going to do this, and uh, you'll have as much funding as you need, period. And that's what was done, and it was a remarkable accomplishment. But there's just nothing like that in the way of resources evident for this report for Mars One. We only have one minute left, but do you, two quick questions. You can give two quick answers. Do, do you think we'll ever get to Mars in, in your mind lifetime? And, and, and should we just go to the moon first? Should we do that again to, to remind us, you know, what's involved? Yes, there's, there's, uh, they're talking about minerals on, on the moon, and that's something that's uh, 
reasonable. You know, it's just a couple of days flight away. You can bring people back. You can rescue them if there are problems. But when you're thinking of a trip seven months long, you just can't come back that uh, that easily. Gordon, great uh, commentary. Uh, thanks so much for this. You're very welcome.